I'm Lisa, and we're here for a little small talk today with journalist Peter Levenheim, author of In the Neighborhood, The Search for Community on an American Street, One Sleepover at a Time. Peter is going to be visiting Tampa for the 2010 Tampa Jewish Book Festival on Monday night, November 15th at the Westin Hotel at 7 p.m. Welcome, Peter. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So it took a brutal murder-suicide in your neighborhood to open your eyes to the fact that no one in your neighborhood was really talking to each other. Is that right? Yeah, I guess that's too bad that it, it took a tragedy like that, but uh, I, I really had not been thinking about neighborhoods and how we live as neighbors until that happened. But, uh, you know, there's this, there was this family down the street, a husband and wife and their two kids, a boy 11 and a girl 12, and he came home one night and killed his wife and then himself, and the kids ran screaming into the night. So. Um, they moved away with their grandparents very soon after that, and uh, what struck me was you know, this whole family, though they lived on my street for seven years, in effect had vanished overnight, and I didn't see that anything really significant changed in the neighborhood, except for a for sale sign outside their house. And uh, I didn't know this family well, and in asking around, I learned that really no one else knew them well. In fact, it didn't seem like anybody in the neighborhood knew anybody else beyond a superficial level. So I asked myself, do I live in a neighborhood or just on a street surrounded by people whose lives are entirely separate from my own? That was really the beginning of my uh, interest in this and, and an attempt to see if I could deliberately get to know my neighbors and maybe find or create a real sense of community where I lived. So tell us a little bit about the path that you took to, to try to get to know your neighbors. I wanted to see if I could come to know my neighbors at some meaningful level, you know, not just uh, what their names were or how many kids they have or what they do for a living, but, but something that would allow me to see what the full potential of relationship was with, uh, among the people that I live closest to. And I spent a long time thinking about how to do that, you know, it, just sort of inviting people to have coffee with me didn't seem like it would work. Um, and then at some point I remembered um, my experience as a kid sleeping over at friends' houses, you know, and what I remember that I liked about that was um, not so much the sleeping over but the waking up the next morning when I'd come downstairs with my friend and we'd sit around the breakfast table with his family um, and then I'd get to know the other people in his family who had been strangers to me, like my friend's mom, my friend's older sister, and I'd listen to what their day was going to be about and what the relationship was to each other. And then the next time I went over to that house, they didn't feel like strangers anymore. I liked that. So I wondered, would it be possible actually to sleep over at some of my neighbors' houses and write about their lives from inside their own homes? And in that way, um, you know, create uh, deliberately and fairly quickly uh, a close relationship. I didn't know if anybody would let me do that. So without giving too much away, because we want people to read your book and buy your book and come to see you, uh, how did your neighbors initially react to the idea? Well, it actually, um, it was my daughter, my teenage daughter, who had the first reaction, because when I left my house the first night with my, uh, for the first sleepover, um, she was 14, she said, Dad, you're crazy, you know? And I, I can understand that the site of your 50-year-old father leaving the house with an overnight bag to sleep at the neighbor's would be embarrassing for any teenager. Um, but I didn't think it was crazy then, and I don't now. You know, I think what was crazy was uh, that in our society, somehow we can live um, side by side, driveway to driveway with people for years, sometimes decades, without knowing them. And, and there's no social stigma attached to that. It's become entirely acceptable. So. Um, not everybody um, agreed to let me sleep over and write about them because I was writing a book, but uh, many people did and actually um, overall it was about 50% said yes, which I thought was a much higher um, you know, percentage than I expected. What was the best breakfast you had when you woke up in the morning? Oh, uh, I wasn't paying attention so much to breakfast, you know, I was working. I was taking notes the whole time. That easily is the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, I should have, give some thought to that. You know, I should say um, some people think, well, this guy's really weird. You know, he just went up to his neighbors and said, can I sleep over? It wasn't quite like that. I, what I did is I, I contacted people on my street 
by phone, email, sometimes just seeing them out walking. And I'd say, you know, I'm, we live on the same street. I'm a writer. I'm thinking of doing some writing about how Americans live as neighbors today. Would you be willing to talk with me about your experience of living on our street? And then maybe we'd go to a coffee shop and, you know, talk, get to know each other. After that, I might ask them, um, you know, could I go shopping with you uh, when you go to the grocery store or maybe come see where you work. And, and, and over a period of weeks, sometimes months, what was happening is we were getting to know each other, uh, building a trusting relationship. And I was um, getting a sense of what their typical week looked like, which was important because I wanted to select one day to kind of chronicle their life as my neighbor for a 24-hour period. I wanted to pick a typical day. So when we got that far, and I'd ask, you know, could I, could I write about you for uh, 24 hours? And um, they'd say yes at that point, because we knew each other. We trusted each other. And then I'd say, well, how about I bunk overnight so I could be there, you know, when you wake up? And at that point, uh, everybody was fine with it. What was the biggest surprise you had from this experience? You know, it, uh, interestingly, the biggest surprise came after the book. Because what's happened since the book was published early this year, I've, I've heard literally from people across the country and in many, many other countries, actually, um, who have heard about the book or read it and written to me and told me about the isolation they feel where they live. Or sometimes they're, they're very happy where they live and they want to celebrate the closeness of their community, which is nice. Oftentimes they want to talk about the neighborhood they remember growing up in and how that seemed more warm and, and close and friendly than where they live now. So the biggest surprise was how universal this concern is about neighborhoods. And, you know, that's interesting from a Jewish perspective, too, because what I learned in the process of, of writing this book is that our, our Jewish heritage has a lot to say about neighborhoods. Um, from the detailed rules for the Eruv to wisdom sayings in the Talmud, um, Jewish tradition cares a lot about the quality of um, neighborhoods we live in. You know, how we define who our neighbors are, how we treat our neighbors, and the morality of our neighborhoods. Um, now, uh, the uh, European shtetls are gone, the 1920s immigrant communities in this country are gone, even the largely Jewish suburbs of the 50s and 60s are mostly gone. So for Jews in America today, our neighborhoods are really like everyone else's. They're kind of multicultural um, city or suburban neighborhoods where, sadly, we often don't know the people down the street or next door. So uh, we face these same issues, but our heritage tells us we should care about the, the quality of neighborhoods very much. Okay, so I understand that uh, actress Julia Roberts is so intrigued by your book that she immediately acquired the film rights. Is that correct? Yes, it's very, very nice. Uh, actually, very she exciting. bought film rights before the book was published based wow. on a you know, New York Times uh, op-ed that I wrote. So when can we expect to see a movie? I wish I knew. <laughs> we'll just eat, pray, and wait. There you go. <laughs> so also, I don't know that you know this, that your book was chosen as our community's um, community read, uh, which means our book clubs and any book lovers will read your book and discuss it together and then they'll come together on the Monday night that you're here and talk with you about about your book. Well that's great. I, I did see that. I'm, I'm very flattered by it and humbled and I'm really looking forward to coming to Tampa and meeting lots of people and talking about neighborhoods. That's great. So you'll be here on Monday night, November 15th, and then that night there'll be a special pre-reception so all book clubbers and book lovers should come on down and uh, meet Peter so you can talk about whatever it is you'd like to talk about with the book. It's a fascinating idea. I think I might have to try the same in my own neighborhood. Well, if you try this in the neighborhood, Lisa, you don't actually have to sleep over. You can just like, you know, ring a doorbell, make a phone call, make that connection. That's a pretty good idea. I guess, I guess you do sort of take it to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Peter, thank you again for taking the time to speak with us, and we look forward to yep. seeing you in a couple weeks. I am Lisa Robbins, and this has been a production of Let My People Know, an outreach and engagement initiative. Thank you again. Thank you.